Thanks. Thanks for listening to me today. I'm sure you're all feeling quite tired after lunch now, uh, so hopefully I won't be too boring for you. I can't actually see over the, uh, the counter. But So what I'm going to talk to you today about is the role of primary care in the management of chronic heart failure. I think uh, Gavin told you very well the role of general practice in heart failure, so I probably can go home now. Uh, but I'm going to focus on how we can help support patients in their routine reviews in primary, heart primary care. So the Cheshire Mersey pathway gives us some criteria on the ideal sorts of patients who can be discharged from uh, specialist follow-up to primary care follow-up. Uh, those include patients, of course, who are allegedly stable, who are uh, optimised on their therapies, or patients who are palliative, or patients with preserved ejection fraction heart failure. However, sorry, Dennis, for using the same slide. As you said, it's very commonly used. Um, we may see patients at any part of their journey with heart failure, and it may be a year, it may be three years since they had their last review, um, and we can see them either when they're responding to treatment or whether they're uh, going through a patch of clinical instability or moving into the palliative phase. So how do we structure those reviews? I think we, it's really important that we understand their heart failure diagnosis and stage when we see the patient. Otherwise, how do we know what therapies they should be on? We need to tailor their care and ensure they're equipped with the education uh, to support self-management. We need to understand when to seek specialist advice. And I think primary care particularly uh, needs to focus on the impact of complex multimorbidity and the extensive polypharmacy these patients suffer. So just first to go through how to review the heart failure diagnosis and stage. Well, simply, obviously, looking at the diagnosis that's been made previously, were they preserved ejection fraction heart failure? Do they have significant LVSD? Has a diagnosis actually been made? Have they had a treatment plan in place previously? And what was the cause of their heart failure? Obviously, patients will have multiple reasons why they might have heart failure, and some of those reasons will need specific therapies. Have they had any change in their functional status since last review? What's their, what's their NYHA score? Are they currently stable? Have they got any signs of new complications? Have they got signs of advancing heart failure or increasing fluid overload? We need to consider what the treatment plan was before and is that still in place? Are they waiting for any interventions? Has any treatment been stopped? Have they had hospital admissions that have led to uh, treatments being reduced or, or finished? Has the patient just stopped taking it? Has it fallen off repeat prescription for some reason? We've all seen that. Have patients got advanced plans in place? Do, are, they, are they informed of their advanced plans? Sometimes that's not the case. So our focus is often on uh, maintaining and optimising treatments in a routine review. And you've been showing this flowchart a few times today. And I think probably we're going to focus on uh, the four pillars of heart failure for most patients with significant LVSD, of course. But it's important we don't forget the lifestyle interventions and potential cardiac rehab that all of these patients should have been offered. So when we see them to review their treatment again, we're looking for patients with severe LVSD to be on optimal, op optimal doses of the four pillars of heart failure. And it may be that when they were discharged from uh, a heart failure specialist that they didn't achieve maximal doses of these treatments. And in primary care, it might still be possible to push up this, these doses. As patients progress with treatment, sometimes their blood pressures improve and sometimes it is possible to titrate further. Obviously, we need to make sure uh, safety monitoring is in place in terms of uh, blood, test, uh, blood testing, renal function, pulse and blood pressure, etc., and being vigilant for contraindications when new medications are brought in and interactions. We do need to consider stopping and reducing un unwanted and potentially unhelpful or even harmful, harmful medications for these patients like uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And as I've, as I've said, lifestyle interventions remain important for most patients across the whole heart failure pathway. Not all patients will have coronary artery disease as a cause for their heart failure, and of course we don't want them to develop it. So remembering the ABC of CVD prevention is really important. All patients with heart failure are at increased risk of atrial fibrillation if they don't have it already, and of course automatically will have a high stroke risk. For patients who have uncontrolled hypertension or hyperlipidemia, of course they may well benefit from uh, intervention for these. 
I've just put a few top tips for optimization of uh, medications. Uh, the heart failure pathway does provide some detail on this. I think commonly uh, medications are stopped uh, when uh, things happen. So uh, if the blood pressure is low or renal function dips, the first instinct quite often is to stop the treatment. I think it's really important that we try and pre preserve small doses and reduce rather than stop in the first instance if at all possible. So we can expect a, a moderate decline in renal function for some patients. And of course, patients on beta blockers will be bradycardic, uh, but if their pulse is less than 50, we probably do need to reduce or, and possibly stop uh, altogether. But of course, do check an ECG to ensure they haven't gone into a heart block. In terms of MRA, um, we wouldn't want to initiate an MRA generally if potassium's over five, uh, but usually we can continue the same dose if the potassium's 5.4 or less. Again, if it rises above this, try just to reduce the dose rather than stop in the first instance. For SGLT2s, of course, there is no optimization. It's one dose. It's really easy in that respect. Uh, but I think for annual reviews, we need to just make sure patients understand the sick day rules. Uh, I don't know if you find, but patients mostly throw away any information I give them. Um, so just reiterating what I've told them before and, and writing it down for them, or more recently, texting and emailing, I think is really helpful. Uh, so top tips for diuretics are also in the Cheshire and Mersey pathway, but I think as um, a few of the doctors have said earlier, it's important to understand that if a patient is fluid overloaded, renal function is likely to decline, and it's common that diuretics get reduced or even stopped when renal function declines. And in fact, patients will need uh, diuretics if they're fluid overloaded and their renal function is unlikely to recover until we do that. And of course, we can add a thiazide or MRA if uh, that's possible too. Many patients we see uh, for routine reviews will hopefully be uh, stable and not fluid overloaded. They may have recently had optimization of their therapies. And it certainly may be possible to taper off their, their diuretics at this stage and helping patients to understand how they can self-manage manage their diuretics and uh, restart them should they develop further symptoms is really important. Which brings me on to how we personalise their care and, and support self-management. We've been doing a lot more of this, I think, during COVID, of course. Um, but it's really important that patients understand why they're taking what they're taking. Patients will stop their treatments if they don't feel there's a re good reason. I can't blame them for that. Um, when, when drugs are stopped, uh, some heart failure patients do understand that they need to be restarted. And they'll say, well, they, you know, they stopped it while I had surgery, but I knew I had to restart. And that, that education is really important to avoid any delay on uh, restarting therapy. Again, helping them to understand what their target blood pressure and pulse should be, uh, monitoring for the detection of atrial fibrillation. Uh, Latterly, obviously, patients have um, these smartwatches and all sorts of things that can help pick up AF, and supporting patients to recognise that's really important. Um, in terms of diuretic management and fluid balance, understanding how they can look after sort of weight monitor monitoring as an indicator for a relapse. We need, may need to provide specific education uh, with regards to their employment driving or family planning for younger patients. Mental health problems certainly do complicate heart failure and can worsen outcomes, and heart failure can increase your risk of mental health problems. In particular, heart failure increases your risk of cognitive impairment, and don't underestimate the impact of dementia on managing heart failure, of course. So I think in primary care, we need to have a low threshold uh, for assessing memory if we have any concerns. And many of these patients do become quite socially isolated and have significant social care needs. And I think increasingly PCNs have access to social prescribers who have great outcomes in these patients that improve in their quality of life. And for anxiety and depression and alcohol and drugs, of course, we do have support in, in place potentially to help them. And particularly alcohol, where al the burden of alcohol intake uh, can increase a uh, patient's risk of fluid overload. I think that's really important to address. So advanced planning, of course, is the ultimate personalised intervention that we do. I think the most difficult thing sometimes is identifying the palliative stage. And this may be where, in primary care, we do require some input from the, an MDT opinion. Once we have that in place, I think GPs and practice nurses are already quite skilled in the management of advanced planning, and we've certainly got plenty of experience with our cancer patients. We mustn't forget patients with ICDs and early involvement of the heart failure team when a patient's progressing to the palliative stage for a patient with an ICD is really important. 
So when do we seek advice and support? Well, coming back to the pathway, uh, it does tell us if symptoms persist, we should seek ad uh, specialist advice for the therapeutic interventions on the right. Some of these will have been considered at baseline when uh, patients have a management plan uh, at diagnosis and may have been deemed inappropriate. But of course, as patients progress, it may be that repeat imaging is appropriate and it may be that they will ultimately benefit from these treatments. But I would say whenever we feel out of our depth with a patient with heart failure, we should ask for a review of the treatment plan because there are other treatment op options available especially if there's escalating fluid overload or difficult symptoms to manage. Or if we feel that there's a new complication uh, uh, which is making their heart failure symptoms worse that we can't manage in primary care. Complex, complex heart failure is usually uh, remains under the remit of a specialist such as patients who are pregnant. Patients with complex multimorbidity certainly don't all need to be under a heart failure specialist, but sometimes it does help to um, get some advice when decision making is difficult, particularly with worsening renal function and use of medications. And again, support during the palliative stage, advice sometimes on stopping treatments and almost giving us permission that it is okay to stop treatments when people are no longer responding. And then being able to get the right support in place for the patients, the palliative care support and community care and social care team. Which brings me on to complex multimorbidity and polypharmacy, as well as organisational structure. So complex multimorbidity, of course, is, is increasing. It accounts for one in six GP consultations. And these consultations are often long and difficult. So complex multimorbidity is when patients have chronic diseases affecting three or more bodily systems. And there are high impact conditions that worsen outcomes in these patients and it won't surprise you that heart failure is, is one of those. And in fact, when you look at the list of high impact conditions there, uh, all those conditions happen all, all too commonly in the same patient. And what happens with the patient uh, with complex multimorbidity is that they're said to have an endless struggle managing their condition and understanding what's happening to them. And despite multiple access points to the NHS and hospital admissions and use of healthcare services, they continue to have a functional decline and decreased quality of life. And it's not surprising really that they don't understand things because the, these patients represent a significant clinical challenge uh, to all of us, I think. Uh, it doesn't help that clinical guidelines are usually single di disease focused. We don't actually have any holistic clinical uh, multimorbidity guidelines at all and research and evidence is often single disease focused so the decisions are difficult and they do need to involve a patient and ideally the extended clinical team. So just coming to the organisational structure particularly for complex multimorbidity I think proactive planned care for these patients is vital. Do we need to look at complex multimorbidity clinics which focus on clusters of common conditions such as I've listed there and these clinics need to have a strong emphasis on understanding the patient's perspective and directed self-management. But again involvement of an MDT approach to ensure all the right skills are there to support the patient. I just want to go through if I've got time a, a case review of a heart failure patient with complex multimorbidity in primary care. So I did meet this chap a few years ago before the evidence for SGLT2s um, so this is an 85-year-old gentleman who, who had a long history of an ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, with severe LVSD. He was quite functionally impaired, NYHA3. He had a long history of stable angina, a couple of previous MIs and a bypass many, bypass many years ago. He had type 2 diabetes that wasn't that well controlled, moderate to severe COPD and decline in renal function. He had quite a nasty skin condition called bullous, bullous pemphigoid, uh, which requires oral steroid therapy. His oral steroids had led to osteoporosis and he had anemia of chronic disease. He'd been treated for hypertension for donkey's years and it wouldn't be surprising that he's a bit low in mood, he works with a stick and he's got some osteoarthritis. So I think we can agree he's got complex <coughs> multimorbidity. And his medication list I won't go through in detail but follows all his conditions as you would expect. So his anticholinergic burden score at this point was three, which puts him at high risk of falls. He probably didn't need the ACB score to work that out, I don't think. 
Um, so what was the impact of all this on Mr S and what was the impact on the healthcare system? So in the 12 months before I met him, he'd had four unplanned hospital admissions. And each of the discharge summaries look virtually identical when you read them. So uh, AKI, plus or minus fluid overload, plus or minus falls, and each admission lasted for between five to seven days. And different medications were stopped during each admission, and we did try hard to restart them in primary care. Unfortunately, we also, restart, we also started alandronic acid for his osteoporosis, um, which dipped his uh, GFR to seven and led to another admission. During an admission when he was particularly poorly, he had a DNA CPR put in place, but this wasn't discussed with him or his family. And he had missed lots of appointments with all sorts of people, including secondary and uh, primary care. So he'd really missed out on the opportunity to talk about the, um, the ongoing management of all of his conditions in any planned way. So how did he feel? Well, he was pretty fed up. He came in with three of his family members, pretty angry with the whole world, really. Uh, and he just wanted to feel better. He wanted to play with his great-grandchildren. He was fed up of taking all the tablets. And his family really didn't understand why we hadn't made him better with all these hospital admissions. And he absolutely did want to be resuscitated. He was quite angry with that decision. <laughs> but contrary to that, he wanted to avoid all these unnecessary appointments. So how do we untangle that? Well, of course, these patients do require time. Uh, and continuity and trust and a holistic approach to shared decision making. We need to work on agreed priorities for him, what targets and treatments are right for him. We need to help him understand the diagnosis. And it may be that we don't know whether he's palliative or not. It certainly sounds like he might be. Um, so again, involving the MDT for him um, uh, was absolutely vital. And at the time I was a GP working in the community heart failure service and I was able to discuss him there in terms of device therapy. He wasn't suitable, uh, but at least that helped inform us that he was of palliative stage. And I was able to help him understand his diagnosis, help his family understand it. And I did manage to put the DNAR back in, in place and we discussed advanced planning. And we did that by working through all these targets and potential treatments. And I won't bore you with the details, but some of those are listed there. But what that enabled us to do was make priorities and stop some of his medication and increase other drugs that were going to help him feel better. So his amlodipine certainly wasn't helpful anymore in terms of his blood pressure. Um, he didn't have any angina anymore. So we managed to move his medication around, stopped his metformin. I can't understand why that was continued, to be quite honest, uh, given that his GFR dipped to seven at one point. Um, we were able to preserve some renal function there and improve his, his diuretic management. And actually we managed to take him down to just nine medications a day, which is a bit better than 16. And his anticholinergic burden score was one. And actually, he did feel quite a lot better. He understood his diagnosis better. He was calmer. He was happy. He understood what the plans were, as did his family. And in fact, he never went into hospital again. So he lived for another two and a half years. I saw him quite a lot, tried to encourage him onto Entresto. Absolutely wasn't having any of it. Didn't want to go back into hospital again. Didn't want to take any risks. That was absolutely fine. So we supported him in what he wanted to do and got the services in that he required. And he did die peacefully at home with his family around him. So really what I feel the role of primary care is, is obviously from prevention to death for all of our patients. But we certainly have a role in the holistic, coordinated, uh, patient-centred approach to managing heart failure. Of course, we do need to have a focus on optimising and maintaining treatments. We do need to consider carefully the impact of complex multimorbidity and possibly in primary care we are best placed to at least start those discussions. We need to be able to recognise advancing disease and get the support that we need when we need it from the multidisciplinary team approach. Thank you.